Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Paula Golden, Executive Director of the Broadcom Foundation and Director of Broadcom Corporation Community Affairs. An attorney with a long history of service to nonprofits, Golden served as Vice President for Alliances at the XPRIZE Foundation, Vice President of St. John's Health Center Foundation, Director of Development for the Neurosciences at UCLA, Executive Director of the Engineering Center Education Trust, and was Assistant Dean and Instructor of Law at New England School of Law. Paula has generously agreed to share some of her experiences with us, and I'd like to thank you, Paula, for joining us today. I'm delighted to be here, Mark. So you've had this really wonderful career trajectory, which takes you from the law and the law and education uh, all the way through nonprofit program work, fundraising, and now as a grant maker for a uh, corporate foundation. That's quite a transition, yet you actually seem through this process to have a multidimensional view. Could you talk a little bit about your perspective on the nonprofit sector and the challenges that are facing nonprofits today, particularly when it comes to ensuring that that funding is sufficient to meet the need uh, for programs? You know, um I think I'll start by saying something that kind of runs through everything that has been part of my life and career, which is I think some people are born with nonprofit or service DNA. And it's really interesting to me that the people I know who are the best leaders in nonprofit work really come to it first from the heart and then to the head. So you could end up with being a lawyer as I, I was, uh, an educator as I was. Um, a minister, I've uh, met number, numerous people who've gone from the ministry, obviously, into nonprofit leadership. But uh, business to nonprofit leadership, I've met some interesting people recently in that score. People like, such as yourself, who have just sort of always been uh, sort of focused on the service component of societal goals and objectives. And so for me, um, where I am today and what I've done, the, the thread is the DNA. It's not necessarily the job at hand, whether it's giving the money away or uh, raising the money, it really is uh, kind of a, a fundamental attitude about service. Um, the whole profession has matured in the last 50 years and gone from being um, al just simply altruistic to understanding that this is a business and that failing to view it that way uh, will be the determinant factor of success or failure for most nonprofits. And so for me, having seen the maturation of nonprofit work and looking at the leadership today vis-a-vis -vis the leadership of 30 years ago, um, I just think there are so many stories to be told that are important uh, to help nonprofits uh, succeed So in having a great market. mission and good intentions and passion, it's not enough? Uh, it absolutely is not enough. I mean, those things will start. It, it, same with entrepreneurial work and business. They will start a good enterprise, but they will not mature it or allow it to grow and thrive. It won't sustain it. That's right. And that's why, I mean, again, going back to the business model, oftentimes you've got a guy who develops the widget. Right. And if he's the CEO, you're in trouble. He's got to find himself a partner who understands the business of making and selling widgets. So the same is true in nonprofit. And one of uh, uh, something we can perhaps talk about is uh, what I call founder syndrome, which I've I think uh, we, we understand to be kind of a, a dangerous thing in nonprofits if, it, if it's not properly understood. Um, in a nonprofit, oftentimes the persons or the persons who begin it have a passion. It comes from an experience which triggers their belief, their, their deeply held belief, that the nonprofit must succeed because the world would be better for it. It's in, that's their DNA mo uh, motivation. That deeply held belief will only carry them so far. And it will only it certainly will not be the thing that will drive uh, their fundraising and their operations in the long run. You need to understand the three elements that will either bring money in or release money to. Okay. Those three things in my mind have always been head, heart, and hand. Let's talk about first the fundraiser. Okay. The fundraiser needs to have in front of him or her uh, an objective, namely the funder, who intellectually grasps why they are doing what they are doing, has the capacity to give the resources, mm -hmm. and connects with the cause. 
failing to have all three of those elements, you will not get money. I mean, it's that simple. And I say this to anybody who wants to, wants to talk about it because you can believe to, to your core that um, curing cancer is the most important thing to fund. But unless the donor in front, of, and you need $4 million to do it, unless the donor in front of you can have the capacity to give you that money and believes as you do that that is important, even if intellectually they know cancer is something that should be cured, believes as you do through their, in their core, in their heart, you just aren't going to see that money. Now for the reverse for the funder is that a funder usually has funds because they have a deeply held belief, they have a series of core values, and they have capacity. And failing again to understand that your funder, if you're fundraising, that your funder's capacity is X and going to them for, with the wrong number or the wrong strategy, because as we always say in the business of any business, it's not the price, it's the terms, right. you will not see the money. So head, heart, and hand, basic rule on both sides. And what is the role of the funder in shaping and in influencing uh, programs um, that they are funding? You know, there's a lot of power in money. And he who has the gold, he or she, who has the gold rule. And I want to make a point about she. In today's world, uh, where men still are unfortunately not outliving their wives, there are many, many, many uh, wonderful philanthropists who uh, came to the game late in terms of managing money, uh, who, are, who are leading some great philanthropies in this country, family philanthropies. We just lost Flora Thornton, who was one of my great mentors and friends, who. Um, as the wife of Tex Thornton, became very wealthy when he passed away, managed a foundation, and learned, and this gets to your question, learned how to marshal her resources and rule the gold. Now what this comes down to is, using by example, um, she believes very strongly, she believes very strongly that music was an essential element to education. She was invited by Stephen Sample, the former president of, of SC, uh, to come and uh, consider making a gift to name the School of Music. Well, Flora did do that, but she only did it on her terms. And if you look at the documents that preceded the signature of, uh, and, and the trail of, 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 of communications that preceded the signature on that grant, you will see that Flora quietly and, and with great, uh, uh, great care and love for USC gave them the money the way she saw it to be spent. And when I was at UCLA, I took many donors aside and said, look, you can give your money to this institution or you can direct this money to the institution. You choose. And so I greatly believe that it's very important for funders to, to think before they write their check. Well, it's interesting that you took that approach because basically what you're, what you're conveying there is to engage the, the expertise and the ideas of your donors, not to block those expertise, that expertise, not to block those ideas, but actually opening a door and saying, come in and be a part of shaping this institution. The biggest mistake that a, that a fundraiser can make is to walk in and have a plan in place. That fundraiser should walk in and listen, because until you understand what will give the person in front of you the greatest satisfaction, back to the head, heart, hand, give them the satisfaction of that gift, you're at risk. So I, I think that stopping and understanding your donor is very important. The other thing I would say is that any fundraiser worth their salt in any organization will understand that they want a donor for a lifetime. The gift in front of them is irrelevant. The lifetime of gifts is what they should be focused on. And you only achieve that by being, first of all, a good human being who is open. Second of all, understanding the needs and wants and desires of your funder. And third of all, looking for ways of engaging them beyond the dollar. And your donors and your, uh, your board members, your donors, your community actually sees the impact of that change. The, the $5,000 donation and the $100,000 average donation are materially different. So true, so true. And, and oftentimes, again, um, particularly with smaller and um, uh, perhaps less sophisticated nonprofits, they fear putting the right number on things. They actually are, live in fear that they're going to either uh, offend the person in front of them 
or uh, the no will be so painful they'll never ask them again. So uh, again, it gets back to what are the skills of a good f fundraiser? It's to shore up the, the fearful, uh, uh, really the client, if you will, the, 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 the institution that wants to raise funds, to shore them up, to have them understand the business proposition at hand, and to give them, quite frankly, the right tools and the right preparation to go into that meeting what I call the three-legged stool. That meeting is three people. It's the funder, it's the product, it's the ask. And those three elements need to kind of be um, really scoped out before you walk in the door. Otherwise, you're at risk. So now as a grant maker, let's say you're approached and the, the, the product is good, the yeah. program is great, yeah. it's having a real impact on community, but the, uh, the approach is horrible. I'm gonna tell you a story I have just yesterday. Um, and I'll, I'll preface it by saying just a little bit about Broadcom Foundation. Broadcom uh, is a company, we'll talk a little bit about it, but it's a high-tech company. I call it the company that puts the secret sauce in everything from your Blackberry and your, your Dell computer or your whatever. We, we're your secret sauce. Can you share the secret? Yeah, basically, uh, Henry Samueli was in seventh grade and he figured out that he, that he liked shortwave radios. He built a radio. And what Broadcom is is really uh, the, the, the chip that allows you to communicate from A to B. In your house, your, your, your little box there, the Wi-Fi box, mm -hmm. it, the, the team at uh, Broadcom kind of came up with that concept of moving data from one point to another. So it's that motion, wave motion part that, that we like to pride ourselves in uh, having uh, really primacy in. That aside, Broadcom um, decided to set up a foundation under its own name. It founders have family foundations. We can talk a little bit about the difference between family foundations and, and corporate foundations, which I think is very important for people to understand. Um, but So the corporation wanted a foundation. Why did it want a foundation? Same reason any corporation wants a foundation. They want to look good in the community where they work, they want their employees to feel good about working there, and they ultimately want to tie back to their marketing and business strategy. And to think otherwise is to miss the point. One need only look at Ronald McDonald House as a classic example of a good business move in a foundation. Why? Because they serve kids. And so who buys a, those Happy Meals? So if I'm a grant taker, I have to know your motivation, and, I, and I'm delivering something that you value as well. Right. At that, in, in the research process, it isn't that you don't you know, cast your bread upon the waters and get lucky, with, particularly, again, we're talking specifically about corporate foundations here. Uh, you need to research what a funder funds and why. And if you understand that, you're going to be a lot closer to the mark going into that three-legged, you know, the, 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 the three-pronged meeting. Yesterday, this guy comes in. He is working with kids who need to understand math and science to get ahead, working with kids who need mentors, working with kids um, who um, are at risk. And he comes in, excited to see me, and starts talking right away. And he's talking up a storm and telling me about every program that they've got. I mean, it was just this kind of outpouring of who I am. And I stopped him. I mean, I literally stopped him and I said, I, and I'm not mentioning names here, I said, sir, hold up here. Take a breath. I invited you here because I've got something I want to talk to you about. So let's get down to who I am and why I wanted you to come in. Ask me that question and that'll save us both a lot of time and save you the energy that you're expending trying to win me over. You know, you had me at hello, I'm already here, <laughs> you're in the door. <laughs> so pay attention. So um, on that note, we, uh, you know, we, we got into a wonderful conversation about mentoring in, in math and science and, and tying that into our biggest project, which is the Broadcom Masters, which is a national middle school science competition. And I want him to go into every classroom where he's got uh, students at risks, get them to sign up on a new project, actually working with an old, uh, old friend from XPRIZE, we can get to that, National Lab Day, get on the online system there at National Lab Day, get those projects registered as projects that need mentors, let me get the Broadcom employees registered as potential mentors and marry the two. And I'm so excited about that. But he wanted to talk off topic. And so, first and foremost, understand why you're going to talk to somebody understand what their needs and wants are. The difficult thing for most nonprofits is they're so desperate for money, it's hard to, to take a breath and take that, take that step. And yet it's the step that will get them the money. It goes back to you know getting more professional about what you do. 
it's difficult, particularly in an economy like this where, where we see nonprofits going, good nonprofits going under. Uh, are people taking you know, two-thirds cuts in their salary or taking no salary to do what they're trying to do uh, for them to say, stop, look, and listen. But they waste a lot of stamps and a lot of time and a lot of energy if they don't do that homework. Now, you, you would refer to the difference between family foundations yeah. and, profe and uh, corporate foundations. Could you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah. Those people on balance have challenges that are unique. Their challenges first are oftentimes they must, if the money has come from a, a deceased relative, husband or father, they must honor the wishes of the donor to some degree. And yet they may have uh, an organ, and this is again something that I think is evolving, they may have a foundation which, which, which has a very broad mission, but there's almost like a hovering, the ghost of, you know, donors past, the, sure. the, parent, the parent or donor, founding donor, uh, whose wishes kind of impose themselves on the family foundation. But on balance, family foundations have the luxury, if you take a look at their, their documentation, oftentimes have the luxury of being more broadly uh, uh, generous in their, in their wealth. Mm -hmm. They have discretion um, either through a, a board or through the single donor who's in charge or the, the trustee who's in charge um, to be invited to play. Funders now impose a, uh, along with their money, their, the conditions, which sometimes are heavy-handed, sometimes are light-handed, depends, but the, basically the conditions are, can you bring with, with the money comes your re requirement to, uh, in, to create a, a strategy or program or a sustainable objective or other resources, maybe not just money. Or partnerships. Or and uh, partnerships, exactly, collaboratives, whatever. Uh, all of that is now part of the mature funding strategy of uh, funders out there who I think are particularly, in the fam I would say, in the family uh, foundation world. And they were geographically localized, whereas today uh, w one almost gets the sense that corporations are actively disengaging from community um, and, and instead looking at markets. And markets are global, international, and so the investment is no longer localized, which, which creates a real challenge for uh, people who actually have to live in a place. It creates real vacuum. Um, I think you're exactly right. The, the today's uh, corporations, the modern corporations, is again, there are some, like say, some wonderful old dowagers out there like Lily. We're glad they're there. Ford, we're glad they're there. Um, but um, these, these newer foundations, and Broadcom, I would say, would be an example of this, are looking at their work to achieve that, like I say, community goals, yes. and that's important to them, but it really comes in the, in the, in the context of how can they uh, contain uh, their workforce, make their workforce happy, uh, create an image which is consistent with their uh, business practices. Now, Broadcom is somewhat unique, unlike, let's use as another example, um, uh, uh, Ronald McDonald. Okay. Broadcom is unique because it's a business-to-business -business operation. Uh, when I first met with the CEO and I was interviewing for this job, I I said, Scott, can you talk to me a little bit about your marketing program here? I need to kind of know what's on your mind, what's, what's your agenda uh, with regard to having this foundation in place. He said, you know, Paula, we don't really have a marketing office per se. When we want to talk to a client, we get on an airplane and go see them. I can count them on my hands. And so for him, um, you know, it was a kind of uh, a new concept that we were going to market outside of business to business. Unlike uh, McDonald's, which is a retail operation, or Walmart. Everybody knows who yeah, they are. You know, and, and you want your image to be clean as a whistle and positive because you want people to come and shop there. Right. I mean, there, as we all know, there was a, was a brouhaha with one of the major retailers this, this summer, and that was going to cost them business, right. and they can't afford that. And uh, so when you look at, 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 at corporate philanthropy, you have to look at the agenda of the type of corporation it is and in addition to just knowing the pedigree of a, uh, of a great, you know, dowager philanthropist in your community who might give you resources because she uh, is courted, you really need to understand what is the business practice. You, what, what I think is so interesting about a business-to-business -business corporation that gets involved in philanthropy, as Broadcom has, is that if one looks at it from a purely 
objective perspective, will Broadcom earn more money through philanthropic imaging? I think that the answer legitimately could be no. No. So it doesn't actually make sense to be involved in philanthropy other than for human value. Yes and no. Uh, I, I mean, I, I couldn't carry it that far. I think that Broadcom is a good example of a company that understands that it has global social responsibilities. Beyond the human factor, it sees itself as a leader. It is now a Fortune 500 company. And it has areas of interest that it wants to champion, specifically that we have sufficient people, human capital, to work in this industry in the year 2035. And there is a real chance, a, 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 a serious possibility, that in the United States we will not. Broadcom now imports a good portion of its talent from all over the world. I mean, you come to the Broadcom office and have lunch and you will see, you know, a global community beyond your wildest dreams. Now, would Scott McGregor, our CEO, like to be able to direct his people to hire a kid coming out of uh, uh, San Juan Capistrano or Compton or Irvine or Tustin, Santa Ana? You bet. Save him a lot of money, wouldn't it? So from his perspective, investing in education, and I'll tell you a little bit of how we're doing at Broadcom because I think it is a good model. Investing in education is investing in his company, and it is dollars in the long run. That is dollars and cents. So, um, and I'm saying that because it's true, and it is actually a motivating factor, which is the right motivating factor. So is it the and case? And it's philanthropic. So is it the case that that social good is good for business? Social good is good for business, and social directed strategic funding of social enterprises by a corporation is good for business the nation and the world. So um, at Broadcom, what we, we decided to do was to set up the Broadcom Masters, which stands for Math, Applied Science, Technology, and Engineering for Rising Stars, target middle schoolers who we believe if you don't get them in middle school, you'll never get them again in terms of interest in science and math, because at that point they're going to say, I'm not good at it, or I don't like it. Right. So we want to capture that group of people, which is the broadest swath of potential scientists and engineers you can get before the, 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 the window begins to close in high school and college even more narrowly in graduate school. So we, that's, our, that's our catchment. So we decided to set up this national program and we're delighted to be doing that with this partnership with Society for Science and the Public. And we are now putting in place in all of our locations around the United States, and this hopefully is an incubator for future work around the globe, but we're putting in place a volunteer program, which I alluded to in terms of big brothers and big sisters, where we can get our employees working at the local level with the local science fair or the local school to do uh, uh, STEM work with the kids in the middle schools. You're marketing the idea of acquiring those skills, studying hard, perhaps thinking about that as a, an exciting profession. Well, and more importantly, we're going to try to set up a way for them to see that if they stay with math and science, they're going to have cool jobs, whether it's at Disney, working, you know, or Pixar, and working, working in the arts, whether it's uh, working for aerospace or a company like Broadcom where you get to make cool toys. I mean, you can take math and science pretty much everywhere you want to go in construction. And, you know, there's no place where we want a kid to feel foreclosed if they just stick with it into high school. That's our ta target. Keep them moving into high school with math and science. And I really believe our, our government, our president, and, and, and right-minded congressional people understand this. Philanthropy is going to be an essential element to dealing with social, uh, fundamental social change. And I, and I will say, again, going back to head heart hand or head pocketbook hand in the case of a corporation, you cannot discount the importance of, of, of engaging on all three levels with your funder if you're trying to raise money. By doing that, you, you, you can oftentimes get their attention. And that's, that, to me, is so very important, whether it's private uh, philanthropy or corporate philanthropy. Paula, no one is in a better position uh, than you are to uh, explain 
the differences between private and corporate foundations, the interactions between foundations and nonprofits. And I'd like to thank you so much for your insights. Mark, it's my pleasure. I, I, I appreciate what you're doing and certainly welcome any opportunity to talk with people about what I think are very important issues for this country and the world. Thank, thank you. you.